listeners. Welcome to Grief Out Loud. Remember the last time you tried to talk about grief and suddenly everybody left the room? Grief Out Loud is opening up this often avoided conversation because grief is hard enough without having to go through it alone. We bring you a mix of personal stories, tips for supporting children, teens, and yourself, and interviews with professionals in the grief world. Platitude and cliche-free, we promise. Grief Out Loud is hosted by me, Jana DeCristofero, and produced by Dougie Center, the National Grief Center for Children and Families in Portland, Oregon. When Clara got a call from her mom that her dad, John, had a stroke and was heading to the hospital, she did what so many people in the same situation do. She clicked into go mode, catching a plane back to her home state and getting immersed in the medical world, deciphering prognoses, making decisions on her dad's behalf, and trying to figure out what the next best steps were. As an oncology social worker, Claire knows this world well, the one of medical terms and needing to make end-of-life plans, and having to push emotions aside to do all of that. After a few days in the hospital, Claire and her mom took her dad home, where he died. When the emotions did come, one of the first ones was relief. Relief can be common for a lot of people, but it's rarely, if ever, talked about. Sometimes people feel relief because the person is no longer suffering. Sometimes people feel relief because caregiving is exhausting, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Sometimes people feel relief because life gets a little easier without that person. This is the kind of relief that really never gets talked about. But it's one of the kinds of relief that Claire felt because she had an extremely complicated relationship with her dad. He was brilliant. He loved music. He was extremely active, but he was also emotionally abusive to Claire and her mom. So when he died, Claire felt some relief. And then she also felt everything else, including deep sadness. Sadness about the kind of relationship she never got to have with her dad. Four years out, the tears are close to the surface for Claire, which you'll hear throughout our conversation. Sometimes, well, probably a lot of the time, Claire gives herself a hard time for the tears. Because even though she works in grief, she's not immune to the messaging we all get hit with, that basically we should be over it by now. When the relationship is complicated, this confusion about why we are still grieving can get even more confusing. Whether it's the ubiquitous question of, were you close? Or statements like, your dad loved you so much, and your mom was just the kindest person. When our relationship with the person was complicated, we can feel even more set apart from the world even the world of people who are grieving, especially if they are grieving for everything they miss about their person. I titled this episode, It's Still Complicated, because of an earlier one I did, called It's Complicated, where I talked with Joe about his father. I linked them because Claire and Joe are linked. They are close friends who joined a peer grief support group at Dougie Center at the same time, knowing that with the two of them there, there would be at least one other person in the room who could relate to the complexities of grieving for someone when the relationship wasn't all that great. One note about noise listeners, as these things go, the dryer repair people showed up at Claire's apartment just moments before we started recording, so you'll hear a little crashing and banging. You'll also hear some clinking from the jar of treats Claire needed to give to her pup, Nigel, who wasn't super into the repair people. Claire, thanks for taking time to be part of Grief Out Loud today. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I usually start all these interviews with asking people to tell us about their people. But before we do that, I feel like with this topic, it's important to ask, how does it feel when people ask you about your dad? (laughs) Going on four years later, it's still emotional. Um, maybe because it's you and you know my history, but it still stings a lot to talk about him um, and to share intimate parts of our relationship that most people don't share or don't openly share uh, when you ask about people you've lost in your life. You know, just in this moment of me having asked you that question, does it catch you off guard to have so much emotion come to the surface? 
it does. Being a professional working in the field, I, in some ways, beat myself up that I should have fixed myself by now. It's something I should have gotten over, that the tears should not be as close to the surface as they are. But that's the way I am. That's the way I've always been. And that's okay. He's a part of my life, and I wouldn't change it now because I know myself and I know my relationships so much better because of it. But it doesn't make it any less sucky when it's assumed that you're grieving someone that you had a positive relationship with and that because you had a complicated relationship that it's something that you should be over and have moved on. And in some ways I have, in other ways, the tears are still always very close to the surface for me. That assumption, Claire, that because the relationship maybe wasn't storybook perfect, that somehow you should be feeling less grief or have less tears or have less complicated emotions about it. Is that also an assumption you have for yourself? Totally, totally. Initially, when he died, I felt a lot of relief and I wouldn't say excitement, but a huge weight was off my shoulders that I did not have to fear interactions in the future. Um, And now that I've had time to process and learn about myself, it's a it's a secondary grief about and remorse about what the relationship could have been and reconciling that within myself and forgiving myself for things I had no control over. So let's back up a little bit because we just jumped right into it. And I know a little bit about your story and you obviously know your story, but listeners don't know anything about your story. So let's, let's head back a bit and tell us about your dad. Like when someone asks you that question, like, what was your dad like? What do you say? The stranger version or the person I don't know version is my dad was an old hippie. Uh, He loved being outside and hiking, being with his dog. He was such a smart guy. He was constantly reading learning more and being creative and he loved music and the grateful dead particularly also bob dylan or doing yoga in the basement for people that know me or people in grief group uh, my dad was a pretty complicated and tortured man he struggled a lot with his mental health whether or not that was ever acknowledged it was a huge part of his life and his ability to be a father and his ability to be a husband to my mom he grew up in a pretty abusive emotionally abusive and physically abusive household in turn I think really had some poor coping mechanisms in terms of communication and his ability to work through difficult situations. So he was frankly very emotionally abusive to my mom and I. What I do remember growing up is in times of conflict or disagreements, my dad would completely shut down and sometimes over very little things. Again, I can't really remember, but He wouldn't speak to my mom and I for several weeks, maybe a month at a time. While you're still in the same house. Yes, yes. And and I'm an only child, so just the three of us. And we would have silent dinners, and we would have silent pickups from school, and we would do silent homework. And it it was known or emoted that to speak or to ask was not an option. You figure it out. And so that's what I did. Leaned heavily on my mom as a parent. And especially going into teenage years, there was 
quite a bit of strife and I was bullied a lot in school. My dad just didn't take well to that transition. Had a really t- hard time expressing any emotions, whether positive or negative. And as a result, I just felt like kind of a disconnected, angsty teenager from him, uh, which carried on much into my adulthood. He had very serious heart surgery very suddenly when I was in college, which for both of us was kind of a wake up of like, you can't just bury this anymore and allowed both of us a bit of a pass to start working um, or at least communicating on a more regular basis Um, because I had left Colorado and was doing my own thing and really only talked to my dad on holidays when I was back home. I, I had no, no need for him, but after his heart attack, it, it gave us several years to, work on what was a pretty complicated relationship. And then he died. What do you remember about hearing the news that he had had a stroke and needing to travel back to Colorado? Yeah. So I was at work. My mom called me in the middle of the day, which she never did, and said, Your dad was doing yoga in the basement and he had a stroke. I don't know what else is going on, but we're headed to the hospital. Having worked in medicine my entire professional career, I I know enough to be dangerous, but in other ways don't know enough to fully understand what was going on. Then just sat and waited for more news about what was happening and uh, what was to transpire over the next 24 hours. And then they shared that he had had a hemorrhagic stroke, which was likely caused from a brain aneurysm and was being rushed into surgery. Or there was a decision to be made about whether or not to pursue surgery. He, as a result of having that heart surgery, I think five or six years prior, if my dad and I had bonded on anything, it was about advanced care planning, which is (laughs) the nerdiest medical social worker thing to bond with a parent on. But it was something that we both agreed on was so important and If he could communicate any of his wishes, it was his wishes at end of life. But, you know, he was a healthy guy. Um, He had recovered from his heart surgery. He was doing yoga. He was actually probably doing a headstand when it happened. He wasn't young. He was 72, I think. But it wasn't expected, you know. But we had thankfully had conversations many, many times about quality of life and what he would have wanted. And in that moment, my mom and I just didn't know what to do and didn't know what the outcome would be. And so decided for him to go in for emergency surgery, knowing that either he have surgery then or he would die that same night. And that would at least then give me time to get back to Colorado and pay my respects to what what was still left. That's what I did. I came back to Colorado and uh, immediately came to the hospital. And then how long were you there at the hospital? He, I believe, had a stroke on a Tuesday came out of the surgery fine. I was there. Then over the process of several days, a surgery like that, they keep you pretty sedated. They kept telling us they wouldn't know how he would respond for weeks. 
However, like the size of the stroke that he had and the amount of bleeding on his brain that they could anticipate that best case scenario, he would be wheelchair bound for the rest of his life. Worst case scenario, he would remain vegetative like he was. Knowing him and you know, having been through our conversations, I had in the back of my head the whole time, like, if I can't wipe my own butt, I don't want to live. <laughs> it, it became ever more clear that what needed to happen was for him to be brought home to die. Um, and so we did it. I think we were in the hospital a week total, went home on a Monday or a Tuesday. Um, and he was on hospice for six or seven days before passing. Claire, what do you remember being important for you to do or to communicate to, to your dad during that time? So in preparation to go home on hospice, which I had done professionally for people hundreds of times, helped them get things in order and... I thrived personally in like taking control of that administrative task and it let me be distracted for a little while. And the day that we were set to go home, he, he had pulled him off the ventilator and we weren't really even sure he would make it past then. Um, and I was kind of messing around with his hands and trying to get him to squeeze my hand um, and he very clearly raised up his hand and gave me the middle finger uh, which is classic John <laughs> Shepik move um, <laughs> very dry humor but it was like oh my gosh you know he's in there like he's not totally gone and then a couple minutes later, he opened his eyes and told me how scared he was. We had like a very simple but frank conversation about what was happening and what he wanted and what we were going to do. And he confirmed to both my mom and I that yes. Going home on hospice was what he wanted. Being at home was his top priority. So for me at that point, my me communicating to him was not at the top of my list. It was, I want you to know where you are and that you're comfortable um, and where you want to be and that you're surrounded by people that love you. We listened to a lot of Grateful Dead in the hospital, which he was not a crier and instantly brought him to tears. We again, in that like short, maybe 12 hours that he was very lucid, you know, I did not spend that time apologizing or trying to rectify something that it wasn't on the top of my mind and it and it frankly would have been kind of too hard to to bring up we were in all in survival mode but to have our last moments or last lucid moments together be something that we all enjoyed together listening to music and to um have that like shared loving experience was top of my list you know, as you're talking, I can see a bit of Claire, the daughter, there with her dad, but I see a lot of Claire, the medical social worker, there with her dad, making sure he's informed and doing what's in his best interest and what he wants. When did the rest of Claire, the daughter, get to come be a part of the grief experience? Oh, not until after he died. Well, after. I was definitely on professional mode as 
as a survival mechanism while he was on hospice. And even thereafter, I think I emailed you or like looked up coming to the group almost right away after coming back to Portland. And I knew that I needed something and knew that I would, I would need the support. It's like, this will fix me, you know? Um, I don't think it was maybe even several months into coming to group regularly. Was I, did I allow myself to be Claire, the daughter that was grieving? I'm still learning about my grief and it changes all the time. What's hard? And this is a weird question. Like what's hard about grief? Everything's hard about grief. (laughs) What's, What's hard about grieving for a dad when the relationship was so complicated and in ways fractured and in ways non-existent for parts of your life? At the beginning, for me, it was such a sense of relief that I didn't have to worry about my dad embarrassing me or not showing up in the way that I saw other people's dads showing up for them. I had constant worries about my wedding day and my dad not wanting to walk me down the aisle or not wanting to do a father-daughter dance or things like that, you know, expectations of a dad or also just feeling that he hadn't earned that right as a father. And I lived in that for a long time And I was angry about it for a long time. And as my grief is transformed, what's become more complicated is new insights into forgiving him and forgiving myself for what was our relationship or what could have been of our relationship and what the future did not hold for that and the sudden loss. Um, We didn't have six months. We didn't have year. We didn't even have really even a day to wrap up 29 years of whatever happened. We had a couple hours and, and I'm okay with that. In hindsight, seeing other people grieve and have so much anticipatory grief for so many years or so many months prior to a person dying. I experienced that in my own way, not having him in my life, but in other ways did not at all. It was easy for me to shut it out and, and move along with my day. It's almost as if when he was alive, a lot of your relationship was one-sided And in your grief, you're having to do a lot of the evolution of the relationship with your dad one-sided because there were times when he was physically present but not available. And now he's not physically present and not available. Exactly. Exactly. And I held a lot of resentment towards that for a long time. That so much of the work that I was doing was something that I could only do and that he, I would never even dare have asked for him to do that work. You've mentioned coming to, you know, the grief group at Dougie Center for young adults. And there's a whole mix of people in that room, right? With a variety of different types of relationships with people who have died. What is it like for you when you hear people sharing about the person who died and it was like a a loving relationship and they miss so many elements of who that person was and what they meant to them. What is that like for you? It's hard. It's hard. But also I would be in that same position if the tables were turned and it was my mom. I connect with a lot of people in, in that group because it it made it feel like a space that was okay to not have a perfect relationship with that person that died. And that was the first time that I had experienced so many people that 
nothing was perfect in their relationship. I do find it hard at times to connect with people that did have that like yearning. I want to call them right away to tell them that this happened level of grief because I didn't experience that, nor do I also wish to experience that. In some ways it's a little easier because I didn't really ever have that person in my life in that role. And instead I'm I'm grieving the lack of relationship and the lack of closure instead of what they left missing in my life. You mentioned this a little at the beginning of our conversation, but just the assumptions that people make about the relationships that we have with people in our lives and the people who have died and and what those relationships maybe equate to in terms of grief. And what's been your experience of navigating that, of people assuming something about your relationship and then assuming that that must mean something about what your grief looks and feels like? I am very thankful in that those in my life who know I have lost a parent also in turn know me well enough to know that it was a complicated relationship. But of course, initially random acquaintances saying things like, I know he loved you so much, or I know he would have been so proud of you. Yeah, maybe, but he never told me that. It's hard to hear and feels very disingenuous when when that person doesn't know that I was in therapy for five years prior <laughs> because of those same lack of statements. I know that there's many schools of thought about people saying, I'm sorry for your loss, but I'm on the pro, I'm sorry for your loss, because it lets it leave it right where it is. I don't have to share any more than thank you. And it doesn't open the gates to tell me about your dad or tell me about your relationship with your dad. It just closes that door. I love that in the that most of the time, right, if I'm presenting about it, it's like one of the challenges with saying I'm so sorry for your loss is it's oftentimes a conversation ender. Exactly. Like you're saying like for you, phew, I needed a conversation ender. And that all the things we advocate, which is like, ask about the person. You're like, please, no. <laughs> exactly. And, and of course, in, in most situations, I think that that is an appropriate response, especially if you have an established relationship with that person. But if it's some random coworker that knows that you were gone for a month and then came back, they don't need to know. And they don't have a right to know either, especially for people such as myself that live with tears close to the surface at all times. Uh, It can be a really emotional process to tell people about that. And I think at the beginning, I got pretty cold and like somber around just like, yep, he had a stroke and leaving it at that. But I do agree now that I felt the most supported and the most loved surrounding my grief by people that took the time to ask and took the time to get to know our relationship if they didn't have prior knowledge of it and I feel like as an adult even now that the friend group that I have it has somehow become kind of a mismatch of uh what we call the dead daddies club of people that just get it you don't have to say anything but know that you know, that we have shared that same experience together, uh, which is just like a ultimately very uniting bond when no one else knows what that is like to lose a parent. What percentage of the folks would you say in your dead daddy's club also had complicated relationships with their fathers? Oh, I 
probably like 90 (laughs) percent is there anything that would have been helpful for you to know about what it's like to grieve when the relationship with the person was really complicated I think at the beginning, it was really easy for me to pathologize everything um, and talk with my therapist about all my anticipatory grief and that how I've grieved him for years. And so his loss now is not something I'm going to carry with me ongoing. And I wish that I, it would have been like that for me. But what my therapist did do and what group did do was normalize conflicting feelings and that it's okay that you can feel relief and mixed feelings and you're not speaking ill about the dead, that those two can live in, in duality together and that's fine um and i had never imagined it to be like that i also had no time to really process what it would be like to lose a parent until it was happening very quickly and very dramatically but in the professional sense i'm always interacting with children and spouses and And I don't always know their relationship, but I do always give space for them to acknowledge both the good and the bad of their relationship and that they can live together. One of the phrases that is a little ever present in the grief world, and there's many of them, and they all kind of come from the same general just which is like grief is love grief is love with nowhere to go grief is proof of our love we grieve as deeply as we loved and those phrases work really well for a lot of people and I'm curious what's your relationship to that concept that grief is love I can't say that that really resounds within me I did I do love my dad as my dad but my grief exists in a separate world beyond my love for him. My grief exists for multitudes of reasons and the reasons that I'm still emotional about it are not for lack of love because I don't remember the last time my dad told me he loved me, but I know I loved him and I can work on our relationship even after the fact within myself, but (laughs) I don't (laughs) like that saying at all. (laughs) I was going to say, I feel like there's something more blunt you want to say about that. (laughs) There is, but um, it's probably not PG-13. And... It's not something that resounds deeply within me. And I think it makes a lot of assumptions about how people can grieve and why people grieve. Claire, you mentioned the idea of, you know, continuing to work on the relationship with your dad after his death. And that a part of that has been learning to forgive yourself and also to find places of forgiveness for him. And... I always want to be cautious to not paint this like, I don't know what the right word is. Again, storybook ending of I've forgiven him for everything. And now I have this like (laughs) lovely relationship. And so, you know, for folks who might be listening who are like, "Uh, I'm not going to forgive all all or any of this. Are there there parts of your dad and your relationship that you're like, no, that's not something I'm putting my energy towards forgiving? I'm not ever going to forgive him for the way that he treated my mom and I. But what I can give him grace on is that he did not have the tools or the language or it was not socially acceptable for him to ask for help. 
in those ways, I can't forgive him. But his actions, I'm not going to place him on a pedestal, but I can feel connected to him and feel like I have a deeper relationship with him through doing things that we enjoy together, like being outside um, and going to concerts and listening to music. I always feel closer to him through those, but in turn, I'm not raising him up to this level of you were perfect. You are a complicated man with a few hobbies that I share and also enjoy doing and feel close to you when I do. The idea and a bit of fear that, you know, when your wedding, if you were to get married, were to happen, that your dad wouldn't be available to walk you down the aisle or wouldn't want to be there was something you carried prior to his death. And now you are planning a wedding and wondering how how that's all playing out in your thoughts and feelings of, of the lead up to the wedding. Yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> that feeling of relief is still there. I'm still very thankful that it is something that my mom and I can share together. I am nervous to see his family and his close friends, my parents' close friends, that this will be the first time that we have all been together since his funeral. And I am worried about the expectations that other people have to memorialize him at my wedding. Uh, as my partner, uh, his dad has also died and died during COVID. Um, and so they didn't ever have a funeral. And I don't think his larger family group has also ever been together in that setting. And so I want to acknowledge for both that both of our fathers have passed in some way, but also at the same time want to keep the focus that this is our day and our time that we are living on and prospering despite everything. And it may have brought us together, Dan and I together, but uh, it's not our only uniting force between our relationship. And it seems to like a sense of wanting to not have your dad or your relationship with your dad be misrepresented yeah, and my dad was a very different person with different people, and he had different relationships with his friends and his family and my mom and I. Even still, I think people have expectations of of my grief being the same as theirs, and it's not, and I haven't told them that, but... And they probably don't need to know. Um, I don't want to put my feelings of grief or our, my grief of our lack of relationship on theirs. I most certainly want to acknowledge it and and share in that, you know, this is our first time being all together. And beyond that, I don't plan on sharing any any deeper details. <laughs> Claire, is there anything else that you would want to share either with listeners and or with your previous Claire self, if you could travel back in time, space, dimension, about grief when the relationship's really complicated? I think I've said this in recording, but give yourself space. And grief is a journey. <laughs> as you will very cliche here constantly. <laughs> it, it very much is. And for me, uh, I needed a frequent reminder that compartmentalizing your grief does not make it go away. And that, yes, you can function and be a normal human being 
But on Mondays at 630, it is time to wake up your grief and to process a little bit. And having even a grief accountability buddy to check in with or to remind you to go to group or to go on a walk with or go get a coffee with. And if you end up talking about how things are going, great. But also if you don't, knowing that no matter what, if you can reach out to them, having that now made all the difference. And listeners, the reason why Claire picked Monday at 630 is <laughs> that's when uh, the grief group that she is currently attending at Dougie Center meets. So, well, Claire, thank you so much for being willing to come on Grief Out Loud, to share your story, to have your tears be right at the surface as they are uh, with me and with listeners. I'm really grateful for, for you and your time. Thank you for having me. I hope you can hear everything underneath the tissues. <laughs> and listeners out there, I say it each and every single time, but thank you for being part of the community, for tuning in, for making the show mean something, for sharing episodes with people that you think might be helped or interested in what we're talking about here. You're always invited to reach out to me directly at griefoutloud at dougie.org. I do love to hear from people and what the show means to you. D-O-U-G-Y dot is also our main website where you can find all the past episodes of Grief Out Loud, information about our local programming, uh, information about programs similar to ours that we're familiar with around the country and the world, and a bunch of free downloadable resources like tip sheets and activities. We are always grateful and excited to share that our podcast is sponsored in part by the Chester Steffen Endowment Fund. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us again next time. 